When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that together, ladies and gentlemen, we have never failed to fail because it was the easiest thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Yeah, and the award for best listener goes out to me. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, I am excited because we are drinking an old favorite. Today, we are drinking Gumball Head by the brilliant folks over at Three Floyds Brewing Company. This is a wheat beer, an American pale wheat to be a little more exact. And Gumball Head is also a must try if you have not partaken yet because this is a five out of five bottle caps beer. And let's give some praise and thanks to those who helped us with this week's beer fund. First up, a big cheers to Russell in Lumberton, North Carolina. And a big shout out to Kelly in Columbia, Tennessee. Next, we have a long distance cheers to Ian in Yucaipa, California. And a big shout out to Carrie in Cedar Park, Texas. And last but certainly not least, we have a big, huge cheers. And of course, a Ron Swanson please and thank you that goes out to Catherine in Pompano Beach, Florida. Catherine is a longtime listener and our new very best garage friend. That's right, because she and everyone else that we have mentioned here, well, they went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer run. And for that, we are very, very grateful. Yeah, B W E W R U N Beer Run. If you'd like to support the show, go to truecrimegarage.com. Sign up on the mailing list. We send out promo codes all the time to where? The store page. What's on the store page, you say? Beautiful t shirts that make you look sexy and make you smell delicious. So you can buy a t shirt, support the show, and get something in return. Also, if you want to support the show and get more True Crime Garage, check out our bonus show called Off the Record. But only, please, please, only if you're nasty. If you're not nasty, you're not going to be able to handle it. And Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Heather Nicole Anslet Norris was always outgoing and a very active young lady. At an early age, she was quite active, in fact, displaying a true love for sports, teamwork, and competition. She was also an animal lover and over the years collected and cared for many pets. This included all of the normal household varieties with many different kinds of pets, 
but a special love for cats. Heather over the years participated in volleyball, softball, but her true passion was found on the basketball court. She excelled in every sport that she played, but especially playing for the select basketball teams. These are the traveling AAU teams. She attended Perry Meridian High School, where she had many friends and was very social, which was no surprise as she always had a very outgoing personality in nature. And of course, she competed in sports at the high school level, playing both varsity volleyball and varsity basketball. She graduated from Perry Meridian in 2005. At 18, she fell quickly for a boy three years her senior. This would be her first real serious boyfriend. After high school, Heather went on to Indiana University in Bloomington. Everything appeared to be falling right into place and right on schedule for this outgoing, beautiful young woman. But life has its way of shifting. And of course, the older we get and the more we take on, well, life can get pretty complicated. Heather uncharacteristically started missing classes. And then it was time to take a break from her schooling. So she found a job that she really liked, but her family and friends felt like they were seeing less and less of her. Not a terribly uncommon practice, as we all get busy with work and responsibilities. But clearly something was not right here, and Heather's mother, Debbie, knew it. She knew it for sure. Heather seemed to be slowly drifting away. Heather did not text or call family or friends for several days. This is when her mother, Debbie, realized that Heather's phone was shut off. Heather's father went out searching for his daughter, going to homes of her friends, but he could not locate her. He went to her boyfriend, Josh's house, looking for her, but no one answered. So they called the police, and a search was launched. When police checked Heather's MySpace account, they found that her last message said, I can't take this anymore. I need to get out of the state. Where was Heather Norris? This is True Crime Garage. The post on Heather Norris's Tuesday, April 17th, 2007 MySpace page read as follows. Drama box checked. Current mood sad. And with the words not so simply explained, the message was cryptic and alarming. And it read, no one believes me. and No one understands me. You know who you are. I can't take this drama anymore. I need to get out of this state, followed by a series of exclamation marks. And now, Captain, it's at this point that she is missing. Remember, we've already pointed out that it is the police that have found this message on her MySpace page. The thing that's concerning is, did she take off, as this post might suggest? This would be very out of character for this young lady, as I understand it, as she is very close with her family. In particular, she's very close with her mother, Debbie. Now, to bring everyone up to speed, the police are actively searching for Heather Norris. And this is after her family has been looking for her and unable to get a hold of her for several days now. So this information is being shared with the family and discussed with the family, the message on the MySpace page. This is probably adding to the list of questions that police will have for her family trying to track down this young college age woman. But we say this is out of character because while the drama box was checked may certainly lead one to believe that she could have left and her family does agree with that post. There was plenty of drama in Heather's life and we will get into that shortly. So I don't think anyone was 100% doubting that Heather may have taken off, may have needed to get away, 
But the cause for major concern was that she was not communicating any of this with her family. She's not communicating at all with her family. That is what is out of character here. Well, I'm not the brightest bulb on the planet, but when when she says, I need to get out of this state, do you think that's like literal or do you think that's like state of mind? I don't know. And I have my own suspicions about this post, meaning I'm not 100% certain that she was the one that that may have posted. That created the post. This message. Yeah, good call. But moving past that suspicion, it could be state. I, I like what you're thinking there. Get out of this state of mind. But we do know that by this point in her life, by April of 2007, you know, she's lived in Bloomington. She's lived in Indianapolis. And maybe maybe that's why we're saying i need to get out of this state i've i've tried living elsewhere and i'm i'm having all this drama i'm having all these problems maybe i just need to get completely out of dodge but it also could be you know she went to college it didn't work out she now has a job maybe it's just this is not the life that i want to be living and i want to be living a, I need to get back on my path. And regardless of what exactly is going on here in this situation, of course, Heather's family is extremely concerned because this is really just not adding up to them. Given the quote drama in her life, her family had knew that there was this drama and major cause of concern. They see this message. They're looking for their daughter, for their loved one. And they start to believe that Heather's ongoing problems with her boyfriend has probably led to her disappearance or why they can't find her. They believe not just that she took off. They actually believe that her boyfriend may have something to hide, that he's somehow involved or responsible for the reason why they cannot locate Heather. Yeah, her boyfriend being Joshua Bean. Now... From what I found, it seems like they were kind of like on again, off again since high school. Yes, that's correct. They were on again, off again. And that that's, again, the reason why the confusion for this message. On one hand, the family and friends of Heather's can understand why she would want to get away from her life, her drama, her boyfriend, you know, broken up or otherwise. But at the same time, they can't understand why. Why, if in fact she did choose to leave him, leave the area, that they wouldn't have any kind of communication or interaction with her. Yeah, you'd almost think that she'd be like, hey, guys, it's not working out with me and Joshua, and I'm going to move back home. You'd think that they would be in the know more than anybody. Yeah, that would make a lot more sense because of the support group that she had with her family and friends and the tightness that that family had. So let's back up here a little bit and really kind of dive in and review the situation. As we said, Heather found her first serious boyfriend at the age of 18. Captain has already pointed out that this is young man named Joshua Bean. This is sometime right around high school graduation, her senior year boyfriend, Joshua Bean. He's about three years older than Heather. And while they both attended the same high school, it appears to me that they didn't really know one another during their time there together, that it wasn't really them meeting until Heather's senior year. Now, as we said, she graduated in 2005, but Heather goes missing in 2007 in April. But within just the first few months after the two began dating, Heather confided in her mother Debbie telling her that Joshua was abusive. When things got out of control, he was beating her. She told her mom, you know, don't worry about this. Try not to worry about this, that she could handle this herself. And she was attempting to handle the situation, but the abuse continued. And like we have sadly seen so many times, captain, the abuse escalated to the point of person seeing bruises on Heather and bruises all over her body. And then eventually we even have a concussion that she suffers from some of this abuse. Well, we've all been in bad relationships, but I've never personally been involved in one that became physically abusive. So I I couldn't even imagine 
the what's going through one's head when that's happening. You know, I'm we're in an argument and now it's turning violent that um to me that would throw a bunch of red flags and I'd be trying to get out of the situation pretty quickly, but again, I've never experienced that, so I have no clue what that's like. Well, I'm guessing that it did present a whole bunch of red flags to Heather and that's why we're going to see that this relationship is kind of on again, off again over the period of time here. Now, before this stuff escalated, Heather may have been right when she said that she could handle it, or at least I think that she believed that she could handle it. I don't think that that was just words that she was putting together to try to please her mom or calm her mom. Right. I think that she totally felt like, Hey, I'm in control. I'm a, I'm a bright young woman who's on, on my path to greatness. I'm off to college and I have my goals. I have my achievements that I'm seeking and I'm hardworking and I can, I can battle through this and battle through this doesn't necessarily mean that she's going to latch on to Joshua Bean for the rest of her life. No, it's probably she intended to kick this jerk to the curb and move on with things and get on with getting on. Well, it's tough, too, because this individual, they, they might have a really good relationship other than this part. And you always hear a, a lot of uh, people that have struggled with this say, well, you know, the partner kept on saying, I'm going to change. And, I, and that's never going to happen. It's never going to escalate to that point again. Well, kudos for her because it looks like she was attempting to move on or handle it because – Eventually, at some point, she will press charges against Joshua, but then we're going to see him do the normal song and dance routine of apologizing and promising that it would never happen again. Now, I'm not exactly sure of when the abuse in this relationship started, and a lot of times we see that no one really outside of the relationship is always certain of when the first offense occurs. Maybe Heather's mother, Debbie, knows, but it's clear in this case, that once Heather went off to college, the physical abuse was real by this point. So after graduating, Heather moved to Bloomington to attend Indiana University. Joshua Bean was attending IUPUI. Heather, when she started school, she moved into a dorm with her cousin. This was a lifelong dream of theirs. These are cousins that are of the same age, grew up together, and not just cousins, but very good, if not best friends. Like many other college kids, Heather did not have a car while she's living on campus. So her boyfriend, Josh, would often pick her up, taking her back to his place for the weekend. And it seems like there was a little bit of a a, a very problematic reoccurring theme here, or at least it seems that this may have happened on more than one occasion with this jerk. So at the end of the weekend, when it comes time to drive his girlfriend back to her school at Indiana university, he would then suddenly refuse to drive her back. Right. So at least on one occasion, her parents had to come and collect her from Joshua's place and then drive her back to school. Well, he was using it to manipulate her and control her. Exactly right. He's using every excuse in the book as to why he's not going to return her. But at the end of the day, it appears to me, Captain, this is this is an attempt at possessing her. Right. A few weeks later, the following event took place over the Thanksgiving weekend of 2005. Heather and her friend, her name is Aaron, they're both home from college for the holiday. Now, during this break, Heather calls her friend Aaron, crying hysterically. Aaron rushes out to meet her friend just 10 minutes after the call, and she finds Heather still hysterical, but she also finds her with visible marks of abuse on her. There's a scratch on her eye and red finger marks on Heather's neck. When Heather finally calmed down, she told Aaron that her boyfriend, Joshua Bean, had hit her in the stomach and put her in a headlock while they were at his father's home. Thankfully, Heather said that Bean's father stepped in at some point, putting a stop to this madness and that the police were in fact called. Now, it's reported... 
he should have beat his son's ass. That may have happened. We don't know. That's right. not part of the report. But the couple did break up that November. So we have these two young people dating. There's a history pretty quickly of violence and the arguments becoming physical. Then we have this escalation. I mean, at his own parents' house, that's pretty brazen, which will then lead to them ultimately breaking up. That's correct, Captain. Now, unfortunately, the two reconciled on Valentine's Day in 2006. This is when Joshua Bean visited Heather in Bloomington with a gift of flowers and, of course, an apology begging her to reconsider. Thereafter, Heather spent an increasing amount of time with Joshua Bean in Indianapolis. This is because she eventually started to withdraw from classes in April of 2006, eventually dropping out altogether. Heather got a job after she took this break from school or quitting school. She loved it. Everyone says that she really dug this job. And of course, with the new job, Heather started meeting new friends. Joshua did not like this one bit, and eventually he forces her to quit that job. Yeah, I always tell my friends, or one thing I don't think you look for in a relationship when you're younger is, is this person making me better? Is this person making my life better? I just, I, I think you're so caught up in attraction and uh, initial feelings and stuff like that that you don't really or at least I didn't think too much about, are they making my life better? Are they making me a better person? Do they want me to be around my friends and family? They should be supportive of that because that would that makes you a better you most of the time. Personally, I insist that whoever I'm with, that they have a job, they have hobbies, they have their own friends because if I'm the only person that you're talking to, one of us is going to go crazy real quick. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm not that normal of a guy, so it, it will probably be the person that I'm with. Right. Now, we have pointed out, Captain, how active of a lifestyle Heather had. I mean, even from a young age, she's very outgoing, very outgoing nature. I mean, most of us love hanging out with our friends, and a lot of us meet, love meeting other people. But Heather's friends would say that they felt creeped out by her boyfriend, by Joshua Bean. And they also say that it was obvious to them that Joshua was determined to keep Heather from hanging out with them. This kind of goes back to what we saw while she was at school. You know, the excuses of refusing to return her after collecting her and having her at his place for the weekend. It's it's that possession that it seems that he's he's intent on having of this young woman. I hate to jump around too much, but what a situation. If if you walked in on your son being physically violent towards his girlfriend, that would be, that'd be an intense moment because, one, you'd be extremely disappointed. Um, but my, my natural reaction probably would be to... Uh, make him swallow his own teeth. I'm one though, that I don't think that violence cures violence. And I think that the counseling would be, could be potentially a very good thing for this angry young man who clearly does not know how to control himself, his emotions, and does not know how to conduct himself like a real man or an adult. Right. Clearly at this point, he's got a lot of growing up to do and a, a lot of self improvement to, to make. Even though this young man, he begs this young woman to take him back, and it does seem to be that they were able to reconcile and they start their relationship back up again, unfortunately, some things never, never change. And sometime in November of 2006, now we have to in introduce a woman named Hazel Rich. She says that she opened her door, her front door, to find a stranger at her doorstep. It was Heather Norris on Rish's front doorstep on South Meridian Street in Indianapolis. The young woman told Hazel that she needed help. She was asking to use Hazel's telephone. She wanted to call her mother because her boyfriend had just thrown her and all of her belongings out of his car. Hazel immediately noticed that the young woman's arms were scraped and bleeding. 
Hazel believed Heather's story and knew that she was dealing with something very serious here. Yeah. Of course, Hazel allowed Heather to use her phone. Heather called her mother, Deborah Norris, and shortly after the call was placed, Deborah arrived on the scene and picked Heather up, who was still at Hazel's home. This led to another breakup between Heather and Joshua Bean. Yeah, this this guy is really showing how much of a piece of shit he is. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. All right, we are back, mates. Cheers. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers, Captain. Well, what we're going to see here is continued violence from this Joshua Bean against his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Heather Norris. She's alleging domestic battery on several occasions against this guy, uh, multiple times pressing charges against him. And this is going to bring us to the point of early April 2007, when Heather Norris stopped returning phone calls from family and friends. This is pretty early on in April of 2007 here, Captain. Now, it wouldn't be until April 25th that Heather's mother, Deborah, filed a missing persons report. And again, the family stating that this is after several days go by and not being able to get a hold of Heather. So, so it appears that at some point, probably around the 18th, 19th, maybe even the 20th is when Heather's family starts having trouble getting in touch with her. They notice something serious has probably happened here. They're searching for their daughter. They're checking all the normal places, calling all the friends, Even going to the boyfriend's house, the father says he gets no answer when he goes knocking on Joshua Bean's front door, and it will be on the 25th of April, 2007, when the missing persons report is officially filed. This with the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department, the IMPD. But between that time period and April 25th, there's going to be a lot of curious behavior going on. A lot of things that are witnessed by other people 
during the course of just that couple weeks. And this really stems back to April 11th. This is when Joshua Bean missed an important meeting at his place of employment. His supervisor calls Josh looking for him. You know, where are you? We're having this meeting. To which Josh then replies via email back to the boss, doesn't speak with him on the phone. And in the email, he's saying that he was sick. He couldn't come into work and apologize for not making the meeting. He then called the director of the company. So it sounds like he goes above his supervisor's head to make a phone call and tell the director explaining his absence, basically. Right. And it sounds to me like the director was unable to answer the call. So Josh leaves a message stating that he he was jumped and had been attacked by a couple people and had to go see a doctor and receive medical attention for being attacked. He he even comes up with a doctor's note. Like later he's providing his work with a doctor's note, a written doctor's note excusing him from work for not just the time that he's already missed, but for the remainder of that week. Well, let me see if I'm following this correctly. He tells his boss hey, I'm sorry I couldn't come in. I was sick. Then it goes above his head and tells somebody else, I wasn't sick. I was jumped. And then I had to go see a doctor because I was jumped. Yes. I mean, which one is it? I mean, at some point, you'd think his work would catch him in this lie. Of course, yeah. And the the problem, though, here, too, is that's not the extent of the storytelling or the versions of this different story because he does, in fact, go to the doctor and we know that because he has this written doctor's note excusing him from work for the day that he missed right but also for the rest of the week but when he went and received treatment from a doctor this was at an urgent care clinic and he had cuts on his hands and his arms so this does seem to go along with his story of being jumped being attacked by these people and needing medical attention however at the doctor visit, you know, they want to know what, what happened to you. We, we got to put it in our report why you received these injuries. Right. And he tells them a completely different story. He says that uh, there were, he was carrying trash, the uh, trash bags that contained broken beer bottles, broken glass that was inside the trash. And somehow he, he either dropped the bag or there was some kind of accident or incident that ended up with him receiving cuts on his fingers and forearms from this carrying the broken glass. He does ultimately receive 25 stitches for cuts that he had on his person. But medical professionals have seen a lot of situations, especially somebody that attacks their girlfriend and the girlfriend defends themselves. And then that person, um, the abuser then has wounds on them. I'm sure when he's telling whatever lame story he came up with that they're thinking that these don't look like the injury that you're describing. The following day, Joshua Bean purchased a chainsaw, a cotton mop, and a utility knife and black trash bags at a local hardware store. He also rented a rug doctor cleaner and purchased a bunch of carpet cleaning solution. Around the same time, so mid-April ish early to mid April ish Joshua starts telling his family and his friends that him and his girlfriend Heather Norris broke up and the you know to explain I guess I guess he's attempting to explain a way why she is not with him it's also a little weird though too here captain because around the same time is when we have roommates that are going to move into Joshua Bean's residence. They're going to rent a room from him. These two say that they never really saw Heather Norris from the time that they moved in. Now, the one of the roommates was a female, and she would later say that she did communicate with Heather Norris via MySpace, but did think that it was strange that during their time living there that she she had never seen her like you said this myspace post that she left that we talked earlier about might not have been her the communication to these new roommates might have not have been 
her. Well, and I think we need to pay attention to the dates that are given to some of this, some of these actions that are taking place, whether it be from activity on Heather Norris's MySpace page, and then let's cross-reference that with activity that we know based off of witness statements that this Joshua Bean, what he's up to around the same time. So we know he calls off work or explains away his absence from work on April 11. The MySpace post of, hey, I need to get out of this state, drama box checked, sadness is my mood, that takes place on April 17th. That's six days later. And I'm not quite certain exactly when the roommates moved in. So, and I, I can't say for certain when the female roommate says that she was interacting with Heather via MySpace. It could be right around the same time. Right. It's a little unclear that portion of the story. But we know that Bean, he skips work on the 11th with the excused absence. And we know that he's not at work the rest of the week. And again, on the 12th, we have him at the hardware store purchasing these items, which include the chainsaw, a mop, the rug doctor cleaner. And again, around the same time, he's tell telling people that Heather Norris and him are no longer an item. Bean starts doing a lot of work on his home around this time. And then we have a neighbor of his who says that he sees Joshua Bean driving away from Joshua's home in Heather Norris's car. But this is kind of weird. He's wearing blue latex gloves while he's driving this vehicle away from the home. On April 25th is when we have the missing persons report. Okay, so the 11th, he's missing work. The 17th is that cryptic message on her MySpace page. The 25th is when the family files the missing persons report. Somewhere during all of that is when the, the neighbor witnesses Bean driving Heather Norris's vehicle away from his house in the blue latex gloves. Well, yeah, one, the gloves is very Dexter-like, and then two... You, you're saying that she's not your girlfriend, then why are you driving her vehicle? Correct. And, you know, who knows? The world's a germy place. Maybe he's just being proactive with the latex gloves. I don't believe it. But sadly, on May 8th, this is, you know, the family already has all their suspicions. And I'm not going to lie to you, man. They're probably already heartbroken at this point and really expecting to hear the worst at some point. Yeah. The confirmation, the first confirmation that I see of this that's going to really underline their concerns and and probably tell them that this is not going to work out very well, this is on May 8th when an officer from the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department locates Heather's vehicle. So they find her vehicle at a hotel parking lot on the west side of Indianapolis. Now, also in the same month, we have Joshua Bean and his friend David Dawson. They go on vacation together down to Mexico. While there, Dawson's got some, some really bad news because he's saying one night the two of them get quite intoxicated. And during the course of that evening, Bean starts confessing to him that the reason why no one can find Heather Norris is because he killed her. And that he did this at his home, that he used the chainsaw to cut up the remains and then drove around the south side of Indianapolis, disposing of her in various dumpsters throughout the south side of town. Yeah, we've seen that in many cases where they dismember the body and then put it in separate bags and then try to conceal their, their guilt by spreading the, the, the victim all over town. On the 24th of May, the police, they executed a search warrant on Bean's residence. During the course of this search, they detect the presence of human remains in his residence. Now, also on the 24th, 
after learning that police wished to talk with him because it sounds like he wasn't present when they searched his home. You know, they want to speak with him, especially after finding what they did inside his home. Yeah. Finding hum- human remains, you'd think they would want to talk to him. Or, yes, evidence of human remains. Joshua Bean leaves a message with the police department and stating that any questions for him should be directed to his attorney. On the 26th, so this is two days later, we have Joshua Bean's father and his uncle. They check in with Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. They're telling the police what the police kind of already know here. They're saying that, hey, my son, my nephew, Joshua Bean, told us that he killed Heather Norris and that he burned and dismembered and disposed of her body. So this is when officially the missing persons case becomes a murder investigation. That evening, they find Joshua Bean at the home of his cousin and they arrest him there. Kind of similar to the Chris Watts case where the murderer confesses to their their father. Yes, that's correct. And it's not long after the detectives pick him up at his cousin's that once they sit him down, he he pretty quickly waives his his uh, rights after being advised of his rights, and he agrees to to a confession, basically of the situation and and the murder that occurred. And this was a tape recorded confession being told the officers that. Heather Norris was staying with him at the time and that the murder took place on April 10th. So this would be the night before he has the eventually excused absence from work. He says that the two of them began to argue. And during the course of this argument, he stabbed Heather multiple times with a steak knife. This took place in the basement of his home. He said that he then took, went to great lengths to, to conceal the murder and to dispose of her body again, placing her remains in various dumpsters around the South side of Indianapolis. Joshua also said that he cleaned the laundry room area with bleach painted with black paint. He painted the walls of this basement and stairwell with black paint and the basement bathroom as well. He said that he hired someone to replace the carpet on the basement stairs We do have, just like you had said, you referenced the Watts case. In this situation, we have his father and uncle were present for a portion of this interview where he confesses once again to killing Heather Norris. So with the confession, that is going to... It doesn't make, obviously, anything better, but it's going to make convicting this murderer and putting him behind bars where he should be so he can't hurt anybody else again a lot easier than than it would if he just kept trying to deny it and trying to keep concealing that he's the murderer. Yeah, so this is one of those cases where it's it's very difficult and it's often difficult to to prove because here we have no body. Yes, they found evidence of human remains, but from my understanding captain, those were like in the form of ashes. Right here. So what we have is everyone else's statements of, Hey, I saw him doing this. I saw him move her vehicle. There was even one witness that said we witnessed her vehicle in his garage for multiple days after she was no longer around. And it was only until one of us says to him, Hey, what's her car still doing here? I thought you guys broke up that he decides to move the vehicle. Right. So he moves the vehicle. And of course it's, as we already discussed, he's seen moving the vehicle, wearing these latex gloves. He purchases all these strange items that would go along with his confession to his friend, to his father, to his uncle, and then police. Well, Walmart and stores like this should come up with like like a kill kit or like a covering up your murder kit because some of these you want to be put on a list if you buy a chainsaw. Well, <laughs> some of these some of these idiots actually would buy those packages. Um, oh, you're saying they should market. Yeah. Market it as a, a murder cover up kit. Cause some of these guys would be like, well, it's all in one box. It's a, it's a good value. Um, and you just have a detective waiting 
in hiding right, that, that right. tackles you as you leave the store. Well, no, and and, that, and like you said, it's difficult because we already know uh, a defense attorney can eat that up as far as we already know that she was at the house and that she was present throughout that house. So there's a lot of pieces of evidence that you could argue away. Correct. The ash form gets a little difficult, but that's not really going to be, as you're pointing out here, Captain, clearly pointing out, that's not going to be the biggest part of their case. The biggest part of their case is going to be everyone's statements and then all their statements of his activities and his actions during the course of the time that she was missing and police and family and friends are looking for her. Right. They're all very suspicious. And then they go along with all of the confessions the, he has made. So you're absolutely right. The confessions are going to make this trial a lot easier. Now we say trial because you would think that this dude would just plead guilty. Yeah. Well, he, he does not. He actually decides to fight the charges, the charge of murder. And he has his attorney work to try to suppress the, some of this evidence. He wants to remove his confession to police from the trial. And there well, was a, a case that was there was a case that was referenced in leading up to his trial uh, because there was another Indiana case where there was no body that kind of set the precedent for taking a case like this to trial with no body because we've seen that being a problem many many times yeah. now most of the time we don't have any formal confession in those types of cases here thankfully. He confesses to police and thankfully they record the confession. I, I'm screaming that to all of law enforcement everywhere. Please can record all interrogations, all questioning, all confessions, because right. that's the best way for that information to hold up. Should you need for it to hold up? And I'm sure that this, these detectives probably didn't think we're going to have a trial here when he's sitting here telling them exactly what he did and exactly how it went down. Yeah, but even if they didn't have that, man, it'd be tough if you're on the jury and to hear this SOB's dad say, hey, he, my son confessed to me. If he ended up taking the stand against his son, that that's pretty damning. Yeah, his trial will only take about four days. So he's he is charged with murder and abuse of a corpse. This on May 31st of 2007. And the trial started on August 4th and lasted until August 8th of 2008. So he received 68 years for this murder. 65 of it was for the murder itself and three for the abuse of a corpse. Now, he did appeal this and he really appealed everything. He appealed, I mean, absolutely everything. He he appealed the, the confession. He confessed appealed the the evidence he basically wanted to get everything thrown out and the state of indiana reviewed this and basically said denied uh we we've looked at everything that you sent to us he, because his claim is that every time he confessed to killing heather that he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol that he he was either intoxicated or in the as he says, when he confessed to police, he had been drinking and he had took, I think it was four or five Xanax pills. And uh, I mean, of, of course he would. He's got to be nervous as hell. The police know what you've done. They know that you're a murderer and they're about to lock you up for a very, very long time. Specifically here, Captain, I'm reading from my notes. It says that he says that he took four to six shots of Jägermeister and three or four pills of Xanax. Do not people at home. Do not do that. Yeah. That's not a fun drinking game. Yeah. Don't just, mix Xanax in alcohol. And here, here's another uh, thing. Probably don't do six shots of Jägermeister either. I don't, I've never had a situation where that ends nicely. Well, I don't listen to the curl on that one. That's, it always goes down good. Um, or like my father likes to say, Jägermeister, that's the drink people drink when they don't like themselves. Right. Um, no matter how many cases we do, you go 65 years for a murder. It just doesn't seem long enough. And then only three years for the charge of abuse of a corpse. Just It just never seems 
long enough. Well, and obviously, Joshua Bean has a history of violence. He's prone to violence. He's a violent individual, especially when it comes to his then girlfriend or on again, off again, girlfriend, Heather Norris. But I have, I have some other questions here because my questions are, of course, these other situations got out of hand, got out of control with, with Joshua behaving like a monster time and time again. Yeah. But the questions I have here too, is that it looks to me like she was due to testify against him in some of the charges that she had pressed against the assault charges, the previous assault charges. Right. That she was set to testify against him, I believe, later that month in April. So I don't know if, if an argument started because of that. There is some suggestion and has been some evidence that he was growing marijuana in the basement and maybe – an argument started because of that. It, it seems to me like there'd be many reasons for the two of them to be, to ar- to be arguing. But I, I just question: is there a chance here that, that no argument took place and that he was just, he planned this. It doesn't look to be well planned out. Right. Uh, so maybe he didn't plan it, but I'm just throwing that out there that it looks to me like she was set to testify against him and see through on some of those charges that same month yeah we just we need to do a better job as a society trying to raise these these boys into men they're they're just not there's too much abuse there's too much um, mental illness there's too much i mean it's it every week you know and i'm sure that joshua bean's father wishes he handled the situation with his, with his son differently. Um, and maybe even demanded that he stayed away from her. It's a very sad case. It is a very sad case. And it's a situation where, I mean, who knows? I mean, we, we clearly, we, we put these people under the best microscope that we can when we try to tell these true crime stories, but, but we don't know. I mean, maybe his father did do everything right. If there is such a, a, a handbook out there, Maybe he followed it to the T and, and, and this. No, and I'm not trying to throw him under the result. bus or anything. No, I, you know. Right, I get what um, you're saying, and, and you're yeah. absolutely. Because those are some of the details that are left out of the story. It's like, did he sit down his son multiple times and say, look, if if you can't treat this girl with respect, then you don't need to be with her. I mean, he might have told, her, told him that a bunch of times, you know, mm-hmm. and he might have, uh, Joshua Bean might have, grew up in a household where his father showed his mom respect and, and that the men showed respect to women and were protective of women and not abusive and not um, trying to be controlling and, and domineering and all those things. Sometimes people are just, you know, it's nature or nurture, and some people are just born a shit bag, you know? Right, and that's what I'm saying. And And Josh was certainly not under his father's roof at the time of, of a lot of this type of behavior. And we know that the father stepped in at least once and well, stepped in again, going to police and saying, Hey, my son has confessed something very terrible to me. You need to go and arrest him. So this is, you're, you're absolutely right. There's, you review cases like this and you go, what could have we have done differently? Not just as parents or, or families, members of, of both of these individuals, but as a society, and, and how do we bring up our young and make sure that this never happens again? And of course the answers, they're just not so simple. They, they really just are not so simple here. When you feel bad, you know, for her friends and family, but, but also again, it's, there's so many victims in these stories. One person touched so many people's lives and, but also I'm sure at some point when this Joshua Bean was five, six years old, that his parents and his family and friends didn't think that this is how his story was going to end. Uh, so there's just so many victims in this, and but we, we need to do better at trying to raise better people. Well, and unfortunately, his story doesn't end. I mean, yes, he's locked up, but his earliest possible release date is 
July of 2040. So he's he's younger than you and I, Captain. His birth year was 1984. He could be out um, at some point, and and hopefully, uh, hopefully that does not happen. I think this individual should be locked up and locked away for good here. There are some other little details that I do want to throw in before we wrap up for this week here, Captain. It was stated by his friend Dawson, who passed along information that he said that he received firsthand from Joshua Bean while they were drinking together, partying together on their trip in Mexico. He he would later tell law enforcement and testify against his, his one-time friend that uh, – that he was told by Joshua that Heather entered 911 in her phone and threatened to call police. And this was for a multitude of reasons, multiple reasons here. And that they, they were fighting. And, and I mean, this is who knows if some of this stuff is true because it's coming from Joshua Bean and we've already seen what kind of character he has, but he told Dawson that, Heather's last words to him were, I love you, Josh. Um, and there was some, I mean, if, if any good could come of this, it, it came from Heather's family and a lot of their hard work that they have done after the murder. And we have a foundation called Heather's Voice that was started by Heather's mother, Debbie. This is a nonprofit organization that educates teenagers about domestic violence and healthy relationships. There is a memorial scholarship fund that was set up. There is a foundation called Heather's Closet that was set up. There was a lot of good that her family has been able to do since this horrible portion of their lives and this horrific tragedy. The National Teen Dating Abuse Helpline is... 1-866-331-9478. And the National Domestic Violence Hotline is 1-800-799-7233. And we ask that you not forget Heather Norris or Heather's story. If anyone out there is experiencing anything, anything like what Heather experienced in her relationship, or if you know of someone that is experiencing anything like that, please contact one of those numbers, help your friend, help yourself. There are people out there that are able to help you in your situation. And not just if you're experiencing physical violence, but if you're also being, if you're being threatened with physical violence, even if it hasn't escalated to that point, uh, don't hesitate to reach out and try to get help for the situation you're in. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. Thanks for picking up what we're putting down. Make sure you subscribe to the show and leave us a five-star review if you think we're worth it. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading this week? This week, Captain, we are recommending The Murderer Across the Hall, a book written by Crystal O'Keefe. O'Keefe lived with Joshua Bean when he murdered Heather Norris in April of 2007. O'Keefe and her then-boyfriend moved in with Bean about a week before the murder. O'Keefe later testified against Joshua Bean, which resulted in his conviction. Proceeds from this book will support the Domestic Violence Network and Heather's Voice, an organization started by Heather Norris's mother after her murder. Check out The Murderer Across the Hall by Crystal O'Keefe. You can find that great book and many others at our website on our recommended page. That's truecrimegarage.com. Yeah, so many books. If you're into reading, it's the best way to do a deep dive into these cases. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us back here in the garage next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.
you can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.